Hi, welcome to TFIR case studies. And today we have with us Chris Alfano, CTO of Jarvis. Chris, first of all, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about the company Jarvis. So Jarvis helps uh, mission-driven communities and organizations craft their own open source cloud technology and, and put it to work for people on the ground. Um, when we first started Jarvis, I was working full-time inside a Philly public school. Um, and a lot of our early work was focused on working with schools and nonprofits and community events and small organizations around Philadelphia. Um, and as we grew into helping some of the world's largest enterprises, we tried to maintain this balance of ground local work and this sky high enterprise work. And something that always struck us was how there was this whole world of amazing services and innovation being dedicated to empowering enterprises and the largest companies to make use of technology. But at the same time, smaller organizations just weren't having things designed for them. Um, and, and too often they were ending up um, almost as sharecroppers, right? Using software that they don't own, that they can't change. And what's ironic about this is so much of this innovation in the enterprise space is built on the backs of open source software, things like Linux and Git. Um, and MySQL, right, that were built with these strong copyleft licenses and, and these ideas of empowering people to not just use software, but be able to change the software they use, be able to use it as they see fit, being able to share it with their peers. Um, and so we learned a lot along the way, and today Jarvis is shifting gears to work on bringing what we've learned to the masses. Um, and by masses, I mean mission-driven communities that uh, work together, work on health, learning, and, and, and play, uh, you know, the things that make up our everyday lives. Can you give some example of what kind of people or organizations do you help? Yeah, so building on my work initially in schools when we first started Jarvis, um, we very quickly started partnering with innovative schools around the world. So the school I worked with was called the Science Leadership Academy here in Philadelphia. It was, it was started by a guy named Chris Lehman that I saw speaking in a dark basement in Philly at an at a night talk. Um, he talked about how um, schools needed to be reinvented with technology, how what we had right now was uh, schools plus technology. Um, and it'd be like if when the printing press was invented, you just had Europe plus the printing press, but really what you got was a whole new Europe and the same transformation needs to happen with schools. Um, he talked about how schools needed to be inquiry driven. They needed to focus on um, producing citizens, not workers. And this all really appealed to me and my collaborators at the time. And we had wanted to build software for schools, but we had been thinking about it in the traditional Silicon Valley approach of we're gonna build something that's gonna grow quickly. We're gonna skip working with administrators and districts and schools because they're too slow. It's, it's not gonna grow fast enough. We're gonna be really top down and, and revolutionize and disrupt. Um, and we took this sharp turn when we, when we partnered with the school and we found that all over the world, there are these communities of experts who aren't software developers, they're educators, they're starting schools, they're teachers, and they're just trying to make do with the software they have. They're hacking it, they're getting things done. And by and large, the technology community isn't helping them. We're not building things to serve their innovation. We're trying to build things and then uh, grow them nationally and, and, and ship them to every school in the country, but we're not respecting the learnings on the ground and giving people the tools to iterate. And so as we, sought schools to partner with, um, we built this common foundation and we started working with one, two, and then three different groups of schools that were all pursuing different visions of how schools could be reimagined with technology. And we quickly learned that there's no one right way and that really the right way is, you know, distributing the ability to create software and use software. Um, and so, um, you know, one concrete example of that here in Philadelphia, there was a school called uh, Building 21. Uh, we partnered with them to implement a competency-based learning gradebook, uh, which is totally different than any gradebooks online. They had a very new learning model. Software companies weren't keeping up with them. Um, and so we helped them build that software and work on it year after year um, in response to what they learned as they actually put it in front of students. What kind of services or products are you offering? I want to understand the technology stack that you make available to these users of yours. So primarily what Jarvis has done until now has been case-by-case -case consulting. We've really kind of fun functioned as management consultants that also develop software. And we haven't really put major investment into building platforms and products. It's something we've done as needed, um, but that's part of the shift we're looking to make over the next decade um, to start taking the lessons we've learned and you know, bottling them up a little more for other people to follow in our, our customers' footsteps. And what kind of infrastructure are you yourself uh, using to, to, to build these applications or tools for your users? 
So early on, we started with just renting servers in boxes all over the world and, and running them ourselves. Um, you know, when we first got started, there wasn't anything like Kubernetes, so we had to keep track of virtual machines and hard drives, and we had to focus on all this low-level stuff. Um, and when the cloud revolution started and virtual machines became things you could rent all over the place, um, we still kind of stuck to manually managing it because we didn't see any real comprehensive way to do it better. Um, and so since Kubernetes came on the scene, you know, we, we've been watching it cautiously for, for the first couple of years. And we saw enterprises adopt it in mass. Um, we saw the major three cloud providers adopt it. And, and those were really encouraging signs for us, but it still seemed like it was, it was hard to access for our, the sort of customers we cared about, the small organizations. Um, you know, the big three providers, they're really focused on uh, helping companies solve money by, solve problems by throwing money at it. Um, and it, it just, it, would wind up being way too expensive for the small schools and organizations we work with. Um, and it wasn't until um, Linode came along with their Kubernetes offering that we finally started seeing Kubernetes be viable for uh, the, the, the scale of clients we serve. Why and when you decided to, to switch to Linode, what unique values you saw in Linode? We've been fans of Linode for a long time because they're a Philadelphia company and we're a Philadelphia company. So there's there's that obviously, but it, it, it really didn't make sense to, to pitch to our clients until the Linode's Kubernetes offering came along. And we were early adopters in their beta program and had a lot of uh, success using their early versions of the tool. And we found it very advantageous because of their simple pricing, uh, flat fees. You know, our clients need simple, reliable, uh, service and they need to be able to call someone when something goes wrong. Um, when we would put our clients on top of GCP's uh, Kubernetes offering or Azure's or Amazon's, when something would go wrong and you try getting support from one of those three companies, uh, you talk to someone on the other side of the world who it's clearly their job to get you away as fast as possible. And on, talking to someone at Linode is, is a whole nother experience. We know they're here in Philadelphia and you know they actually try to solve your problem, which sounds uh, silly to be the difference, but it, it really is a huge difference. And, and we can trust Linode to take care of our clients. From the perspective of services, how different is Linode's offering vis-a-vis, -vis, as you said, the, the big three players, which is GCP, Azure, and AWS? I think the big three providers uh, focus a lot of energy and time and your money on solving problems of rapid, unmitigated scale. You know, the kind of problems you have when you're a global company and you're trying to solve everything globally. And that's just not the sort of customer we work with. There's nothing wrong with that way to approach problems, but there's a whole segment of the economy where folks are limited to what we call human scale. If you're a school or a city agency or a, a, a community event, right? You're, you're interacting with real humans. You're inherently unscalable. The way that those organizations and operations scale is that there's thousands of them around the country, not one that grows up to be enormous. And so you're, you're talking about very different sorts of challenges. They need economic and predictable tools. They don't need uh, to worry about global scale. And so they don't need all the things that make the big three providers offerings complex and expensive. They need something simple and predictable and that's what Linode provides. Um, you know, Linode's Kubernetes offering is just tuned to a different market, different audience. How, how are you leveraging uh, LKE or Linode's uh, Kubernetes engine? So a big part of Jarvis's innovations pitch to our customers is the notion of software freedom. And so when the open source revolution first kicked off, it was all about tools that you ran on your computer. And the folks that built the underpinnings of, of you know, all the technology we use today, they adopted these copyleft licenses, which says if you give someone software, you also have to give with them the ability to change that software and use that software. And this is very important. If you're building a business or an organization, you're investing your time, your investors' money, your, your backers' money, your employees' time, your volunteers' time, you're building something, you want it to last. And what happens when you build that on top of proprietary SaaS offerings, you know, things from companies that might change their business model next year, that might get acquired and sunset? You really can't fully invest in technology if you can't trust that you can change it as your organization evolves or keep using it as your economics change or keep using it as the ownership of that company changes. Um, so the customers that Jarvis serves, they're very concerned about um, that notion of, you know, what does their future look like five years from now, 10 years from now, if they've set up their entire business on the back of 
someone's SaaS startup, which could disappear overnight or change business models overnight. And so we talked about how important it is to build on top of open source software and have all of that freedom. Um, now, something that happened when we shifted from the personal computer revolution to the cloud revolution was uh, real people lost the agency to make use of free software. Uh, free software used to be something you downloaded on your computer and you could use it. And then if you wanted to change it, you could learn to write code. That's one option. You could hire someone or find a friend to write code. But I think more importantly, you know, given our, my example of uh, a school trying to implement new learning models, what we saw out on the ground was that not every principal was a coder, but in a group of 5, 10, 20 principals who are trying to start new schools, one of them knows a coder, one of them starts hacking, they invent new configurations, they invent new software, and they share it with their peers. So even if you're not a coder, you can gain the benefit of other people's innovation when they build on top of open source software. Um, and we lost that in the transition to the cloud um, because now to deploy a piece of open source software, you need infrastructure, you need routing, you need networks, you need all these components. You can't just get a computer from the store, take it out of the box, put it on your desk and be up and running. Um, but Kubernetes as a technology finally brings that vision, that, that possibility um, into reality. Um, Kubernetes on its own as a technology doesn't quite do that, but the ubiquity it's attained across all the service providers and now with Linode and others offering uh, service scale to the small organization, now we're finally in a place where it is really possible for a small organization, for a small business to build a technology stack that they really are empowered to operate and run themselves. You know, just with open source software, if you hire a firm to set something up for you, but you can't operate it yourself, you're still basically using proprietary software because only one vendor can change it for you. Um, but with Kubernetes and the ability to uh, port your workload between vendors like Linode, um, you know, we can finally give our clients software and they actually own it. We set them up on a Linode account, we set them up with their own GitHub account, and then we just build their software and they pay us as long as we're adding value to their business, but they're not stuck with us. They're, they're truly using open software because they truly can change it themselves, keep using it without us, hire someone else to replace us or work with us to you know, respond to their evolving needs. What role does Jarvis play or Linode play in making these open source technologies more accessible to a wider set of users without them having to invest their resources into just managing those open source technologies? Yeah, that's a great question. And that really is what's holding back this dream of ubiquitous open source software today. Um, and Jarvis believes that really it, there, there's a big opportunity right now just in shifting priorities. Up until now, all the best practices in software development, all the tools and frameworks and infrastructure that we build are oriented around this Silicon Valley dream of building something in your garage and then overnight it explodes and you have to grow fast and you have to capture a lot of users and you have to get someone to want to come and buy the users you've captured. Um, and we think Kubernetes is just the first building block of a, a whole new world that's now possible. Um, we think that there's opportunity to, to really radically shake up different parts of the software stack. When you forget about needing to support global scale, that, that space is well covered. Lots of companies, lots of developers, lots of tools are built around solving global scale problems. But what about the thousands of schools around the world and, and cities and small organizations and nonprofits and communities? They all need to build software too. And they don't need to worry about serving millions of users overnight. That's not a problem that's in their domain. Um, and there's a lot of advantages we think you can find when you take the foundation of a predictably priced, simple Kubernetes offering that Linode gives that can give a small business for 20, 40, 60, 80 dollars a month a solid foundation of their computing storage needs. And then everything else is defined by software, right? And the software can be innovated, software can be broken into tiers and maintained communally. Um, so we think there's a, an opportunity now to, to develop a, a layer of software on top of Kubernetes that is really focused on small scale, not application development, but environment development. Um, I'll, you know, I'll give you one example. You know, something very popular in the enterprise is this notion of um, microservices, right? Building little tiny components for every single team. And it's kind of a way to model your software out, out of, after your enterprise so that you can avoid these problems of all your different teams coordinating together. Well, small organizations don't have that problem. When you try to put a microservice architecture in front of them, it's a ton of complexity. It's a ton of moving pieces. 
And a lot of software developers today will look at a school and ask the question, could they run their own software and think about all these enterprise tools and, and, and assess, well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, of course it doesn't make sense. Those tools weren't designed for their scale. They were designed for a very different, much more complex problem. Um, and so the type of scale we really need to focus on in ground software as opposed to cloud software is not how do you reach you know, one instance that serves millions of people, but how do you have one instance that 10 people can copy and then one person can iterate on a little bit and share with 10 other people? It's a very different type of scale that maximizes human creativity on the ground. The, the, the creativity and problem solving of teachers and principals and folks that are serving uh, communities person to person. Um, and it's, it's it, if you start from there, I think you arrive at very different designs for a lot of pieces of the software stack. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. We don't know all the answers yet, but um, we're, we're hopefully we've had a head start on working on them. Chris, thank you so much for taking your time out and explaining uh, about what Jarvis does and how you leverage. Not only you are actually leveraging a lot of these open source technologies, which companies like Linode are making easier to consume, you're actually also kind of promoting the usage of these technologies so others can also leverage and they can also build uh, the tools and services they need for their own purposes in this example. Schools are a very good example because they are strapped up resources sometimes and open source does cut costs a lot. You don't have to pay those heavy licenses. So thanks for explaining all that and I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Swap.